So hello and welcome, happy Friday. Today is Friday, October the 13th. That's right, Friday the 13th. This is Back Here Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 228. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for spending your time. That's the most valuable thing you have to give, really, is your time. So I hope that you learned something new today or that you find it beneficial. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description and you'll see all the topics listed in order. If you want to know how to submit your own question, please go to the main website, which is thewaytobe.org. Click on that page, fill out your uh, questionnaire there, and uh, you can be anonymous if you want to. But I do like to know where you're from, what climate you're in, what time of year it is. It does play in how we give the answers that we're going to give. The questions that I'm talking about today and the topics that we're going to cover are from questions submitted during the past week. So what else is going on? Outside temps, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not terrible. It's sunny. 55 and sunny is a pretty darn good day this time of year, Friday the 13th. So that's 13 degrees Celsius. It's a great day to be out in your bee yard. Not a great day necessarily to open the hives unless you're way behind and it's your last opportunity. And for a lot of people in the Northeastern United States right now, it might be your last opportunity for a while because we have what they call frog chokers coming. That's what our local weatherman called it. We have heavy rain coming all day tomorrow, which is Saturday, all day Sunday, parts of Monday. Wouldn't you know it? I have to travel. So that's going to be interesting. Lots of rain coming, which means, of course, secure your hives. Make sure everything's ready. Just always be ready for anything. And what else? Seven mile per hour winds, also not bad. 60% relative humidity, so they're drying things out pretty good. You won't see very much bearding on the fronts of your hives these times of year. Uh, so we're going to be uh, talking about basic things at the end of the video today. Air quality is really good, so we're not getting the smoke from those uh, Canadian forest fires anymore. Really good air quality. So it's a great day to be outside. What are you doing? Sitting there, watching. Oh, you might not be watching at all. You could be listening as a podcast through Podbean. The title of the podcast, if you want to Google it or look it up, is The Way to Be. It's carried on iHeartRadio and a whole bunch of other podcast sources. So, hope you do that. Let's jump right into it. First question today comes from John in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. This is a funny one because here in the state of Pennsylvania, this is a very frequent topic and everybody wants to know about it. We're talking about the spotted lantern fly. It says right here, there are a lot of spotted lantern flies where my bees are located. I've heard about bees making honeydew honey from their excrement. We're going to talk about that too. What are your thoughts on honeydew honey and how can I tell if my bees have collected honeydew? I have a niece who is interested in it and would like to buy some. That's a first. And do you know of a source? Okay. First of all, honeydew. Let's talk about what it is. Spotted lanternfly. Some people don't even care about it. And uh, this year I signed on with the Penn State Department of Agriculture to participate in honey submissions. And the reason that you would submit honey is because if it has honeydew in it, and depending on where you're located as a beekeeper, uh, the evidence of honeydew honey from the spotted lanternfly would also tell the state entomologists and those that are trying to control the spotted lantern fly where it's showing up. So you don't have to physically find them because your bees do it for you. But let's just talk about uh, what honeydew is and let's put that into perspective because to call it excrement is incorrect. So I want to settle that. For example, um, earlier this year I made videos about the aphids that were taking over milkweeds and plants like that and the reason that was a problem for me here is because my honeybees use milkweed nectar a lot. The aphids were on it. What does that have to do with my bees? Nothing at all. But what guards the aphids? Ants do. And it was the ants that were running my bees off of the flowers because they're protecting the aphids in exchange for aphid honeydew. So the spotted lanternfly is not the only insect that's producing honeydew. And, uh, you know, that term honeydew sounds really good. Excrement does not. And thank goodness those two things are not the same. Honeydew is just the surplus sugar that is coming out of the plant that the aphid or any other plant feeding insect like the aphid 
would be feeding on. So what they do is they get rid of the excess uh, sugars because they're after the mineral content and everything else. And then those little sugars that create little bubbles on the abdomen of the aphid, or in this case, the spotted lanternfly, then other insects, including honeybees, find that sugary nectar that's coming off of that spotted lanternfly and they collect it. And honeybees don't offer any protection to the spotted lanternfly, thank goodness, because the spotted lanternfly doesn't need any protection. In fact, to quote Samuel Ramsey, he recommends violence when it comes to the spotted lanternfly. That's right, you're allowed to kill them. Go get them. So um, they're spreading out all over my state, but they're mostly in the eastern part right now. I'm in the northwest corner, so they haven't gotten here yet, not in any significant numbers. But let's talk about this uh, honeydew honey. This makes it uh, kind of an issue because if you're after the spotted lanternfly because it weakens plants. So the big concern is that it's going to damage plants that are valuable to agriculture. And where I live, there's a lot of uh, people that are producing wine. And so they have grapevines everywhere. And if the grapevines are going to be depleted because the spotted lantern flies all over them, then that's a detriment. The bonus of that is our honeybees don't tend to get much from grapes at all. But if the spotted lantern flies are there in great numbers, then all of a sudden the beekeepers are getting this bonus honey, nectar from bugs, which is really just the nectar from the plant. A plant honeybees otherwise would not be able to exploit. So an excretion is not the same as defecation. Defecation are the solids that can't be digested by the insect. Yes, they come out of the same hole. So it comes out of the rectum, right? But just for example, insects that produce it are such like aphids, spotted lanternflies, scale insects, and whiteflies. These are insects that produce honeydew. Excrement comes from all insects. Anything that consumes has to digest and get rid of the undigestible parts. That's excrement. Okay, so these are different things. The composition of the honeydew is sugar, sugar syrup, sucrose. And then of course, excrement is composed of undigested products. That's it. Comes out of the same. Well, just like for example, put this into perspective, maybe a chicken produces an egg and the egg comes out of the rectum, so does uh, chicken manure. But to the point where it connects to the rectum and then goes out, those are different sources. I hope that makes sense. So you can make it sound as disgusting or as appealing as you want to. I highly recommend you refer to it as honeydew because that just sounds good. And the bees do collect it and it has a strong flavor. And remember that you're getting now a nectar source from plants that you otherwise did not have access to. And that also means that beekeepers are getting this great nectar flow at a time possibly when there's not a lot of blossoms in the environment. So without the blossoms producing nectar, it's like, what is going on? Thank goodness for Penn State doing the study and evaluating it and letting you know, yep, that's honeydew honey. So it's good stuff. And the idea that, uh, I mean, I have a jar of it sitting right here. Ask me if I've tasted it. I haven't, but it's not because I don't think it's going to taste good. I'm told it has a strong flavor. I'm told that it actually tastes good. And much like the person who wrote in here, uh, a niece who is interested in it and would like to buy some. I don't know of anyone who's listing it as honey bee nectar that comes from you know, the lantern flies. So if it's honey do honey, I don't know if there's enough of it, I guess is what I'm saying. It's a component to the honey, but I don't think you would get a solid jar of it unless you could absolutely prove that there's nothing else out there. So maybe they add to the list and say wildflower slant honeydew honey. Good stuff. I wouldn't, wouldn't bother me at all to eat it. I think that uh, it's probably good stuff, but I want that distinction to be made because it is not um, the undigested materials that the insects are consuming. It is the surplus. It's a secretion. So it's honey syrup that comes off of that. It's good stuff. So I'm told. Moving on to question number two comes from 14623 Carol Ann. That's the YouTube channel name. Thanks for another great video. Do bees store the two to one sugar water this time of year or are they just consuming it. Thanks. I should know the answer, but not sure. 
Okay, so this time of year, uh, some people are feeding their bees, some people are not. Some people are finding out that their bees have plenty of resources and there's no need for supplemental feeding. And this is actually a good time for this question because uh, we're getting to the point where we're going to start to have freezing temperatures at night, and that's my benchmark. In other words, if it drops uh, below zero Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, then we have freezing at night. Uh, liquid, so syrup, on your hives as a liquid uh, should be stopped by then. And here's the thing. Uh, at the end of the year, a lot of people feed two to one sugar syrup. And then, of course, at the beginning of the year, they're feeding one to one, which is a very light sugar syrup. And the bees use that as an energy source. And the thinking is, of course, the higher the sugar content, the lower the water content, the less your bees are left dealing with as far as dehydrating it down. So I also find that uh, when you feed two to one sugar syrup at the end of the year, um, the bees do store it. That's the point is a lot of people are weighing their hives and they're putting that kind of a syrup on when a colony is too light going into winter. So if you've got a fairly large population, this happens a lot too. When your bees have a large brood area late in the year, they consume a lot of their resources that otherwise would be available to the bees going into winter. And so finding out the physical weight of your hives and looking at the population and kind of understanding how much brood is present will give you a sense of what the demand is going to be for stored honey. If they're light and you don't do something to build up those resources, that colony would be at very high risk of expiring during winter through starvation. And that is 100% under the control of the beekeeper. So moving on from that, there is... Uh, there's a commercial uh, liquid that's available to people that helps your hives put weight on at the end of the year. And uh, that is sold through Man Lake, I believe. And uh, it's called Pro Sweet, And that has some invert sugars in it, which means it's already been through some processing. Uh, some people are concerned that it may also have uh, high fructose corn syrup, syrup components in it. And, uh, but the best thing for you, the backyard beekeeper, would be if you really need to get your colony to gain weight, then two to one sugar syrup. So let's put this in perspective. If a gallon of water is eight pounds and you're gonna make, uh, you're gonna use that full gallon, you're gonna need 16 pounds of sugar, which means you're really gonna have to heat it up. So you're gonna heat the water up and then while it's still hot, you're gonna mix in the sugar. And the best way I've found to mix that heavy syrup is to pour back and forth. So if you're using a bucket, you know, you put the hot water in one bucket and you pour your dry sugar into it. So you've measured everything out. The measurements don't have to be strict. It's not like, this isn't fine chemistry. But uh, the two to one, so if you wanted to mix a half gallon, you have four pounds, so now you have two four pound bags of sugar added to four pounds of really hot water until it's completely dissolved. And if you're adding anything to it, for example, some people are using Hive Alive syrup and if you're going to put that on here at the end of the year as part of that heavy syrup, you wait until the water is cooled down below 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That's because the essential oils that you're putting in there, you don't want to damage them, right? Now there's no damage to the sugar itself because that's straight sucrose. And uh, when you mix up that syrup, your bees do consume it and store it. So depending on what's going on that particular day. And in the spring, the following year when you're pulling your frames and you're looking at those that survived winter or even those that died uh, you will be looking at the supers and it's very distinctive uh, the frames that were full that had cells filled with heavy sugar syrup because they look like white globules in there and that resource is there for the bees but when they starve out or they don't consume it it's pretty evident that that's what that is it's very different from actual honey so the bees store it, the bees cycle it around, but if it gets too cold too fast, they can't do a lot with it. So then it ends up being an open cell in the hive until it warms up again. Because remember, your bees not only can't dehydrate uh, your sugar syrup that you're putting on the way they normally would on a nice warm day, they also have troubles uh, when it's cooler up in the super uh, when it comes to making the wax that they need to cap it over with. So sometimes that stuff just ends up staying kind of open all winter long uh, because they need warmth to produce and work beeswax inside your hive. So that's why you see it in spring. If I'm looking at a friend's hive or something and they pull a frame 
And I see those little white globs in there. And uh, we know that that's uh, derived from sugar syrup the year before, last winter. So that's why you kind of weigh it out. Um, colonies that have that, I would, uh, you know, that have the need for it, it's that or killing them. You know, they could die. So here's an option. Uh, I find that when you feed them heavy sugar syrup inside the hive, that uh, that's when you kind of find it globuled up, like not completely processed. So I don't know what's going on there. If the ones that are accessing your sugar syrup feeder are going directly to the cells with it, which is very different than what happens when you put that sugar syrup out somewhere else. So for those of you who are open feeding, I'm just explaining both sides. I'm not telling you that you should do one or the other. I'm just going to let you know that there will be a difference in how it presents itself in your honey super. If they flew out on a warm day like today, it's in the 50s, but with the sun, it's actually much hotter than that. And the bees fly out if there were a heavy sugar syrup available to them that doesn't have a lot of free surface area. Here's the other side of that. Your heavy syrups, your two to ones. Uh, the bees, if they land on it and they lose their footing and flip over, they don't recover from it. It traps them really fast and they die pretty darn fast. So a couple of things, if you're going to put it out as an open feed source, it should be warmed up. So the syrup that you're putting out should not be at, say, 50 degrees Fahrenheit or lower because when the bees drink it, they're grounded. They sit right there. It kind of shocks their system and they can't fly away. So if you can put it out at 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit as a heavy syrup outside in a feeder that won't allow them to get stuck in it, then they'll feed much quicker and they'll fly back to their hive much quicker. Then the bees that are foraging will deliver that heavy syrup to another bee inside the hive. And so this exchange that happens through trophallaxis, so the bee that sticks its tongue out is receiving the load, and then they'll take that. So the more bees that pass it back and forth, there's some enzyme activity that's going on, and they're doing some processing of the sugar syrup. These are extra steps that may be absent when it's fed inside the hive. Now, for me personally, here's I'm going to throw another monkey wrench into it. So when it comes to bees, a small colony, we have several of them this year because we had late season swarms. We had some extra equipment. I had my grandson bossing me around, making sure that we're hiving bees, hiving swarms, that we're not just letting them go. So we have a lot of underdogs out there this year. Now, how would I feed those? Um, on the warm days, same thing as described, but I put it in a bee buffet inside the hive and I use a lighter syrup. I know that seems counter, but stick with me for a second. I'm only going to put out the light sugar syrup on the colony that needs it the most, especially tiny colonies, because what they do is they consume it and use it almost right away. And they're small quantities. So I don't put a gallon on, for example, I would put a quart jar on a bee buffet. And the reason I do that is because I can later that day, before nightfall comes, before it freezes, I pop the lid, the bee buffet sits on top of the inner cover, and I take the jar off if it's only halfway consumed or something like that. I don't leave it on the hive. The only way I'm going to put it back on that hive again, because we don't expose the bottom, the inner cover is not removed, they're not exposed, the bee buffet stays in place, and your bees can't get up through and past it. So I can pull that jar out, and then the next warm day, so here we go, we've got heavy rain coming for two solid days, but guess what the good news is? No freezing temperatures. So if we have warm days ahead that are going to be wet, we can still go out and put those jars back on midday, take it off again before nightfall. It's a lot of work but you're a backyard beekeeper, what do you care? So that will let them consume it, move it around inside the hive and uh, not use whatever um, honey they've actually stored through the year and they've actually capped and worked up. Next phase, let's say it got too cold where you are and that uh, you can't put that kind of thing on. We don't want to put any sugar syrup on when it's going to stay cold and uh, keep your bees inside. We need them to be able to fly out and get rid of that. So the next step is fondant. And uh, as far as I know, I haven't been able to really pin down what happens. So this is one of those things where just based on my past experience and observations, I'm going to say that the fondant 
never makes it to storage. So when you put up fondant, whatever the source is, in my case, it's going to be Hive Alive, but whatever you use, if it's a fondant, that's fine. You put that on and that's an emergency feed for the bees. And while they're active inside the hive, they can be up in your fondant pack consuming it. And that can stay on day and night. And even when it gets cold, that can stay on when the heavy winter comes in. Because there's a thing, when you get those warm days, there's a little warmth bubble over your cluster of bees inside the hive. So it warms just the surface. The interior surface is accessible to your bees. Just the surface of that fondant is warm enough for the bees to work it. And the more bees that cluster up there to consume it, their bodies generate warmth and they warm the surface of the fondant until they can continue to work it. So the rest of the fondant that's up inside on top of your inner cover, even though you've got hopefully insulation up and around that, the rest of it is really too cold to consume, but the bees, whatever they're in contact with, and this is the way that your bees also consume stored honey in the wintertime. If the, there's honey inside the hive that's too cold for your bees to consume it, but as the cluster moves, their bodies are over the top of it, they warm the beeswax capping so now they can work it. They access the honey in the cells because their bodies are over the top of it. They're warming that honey as they go, as the cluster moves. And the cluster supposedly, you know, I can't validate it, but I've been told by people who I think have great credibility that they move up at one millimeter per day. So we get a lot of answer for a very simple question. Do bees store the two to one sugar water this time of year. They do, but there's different amounts of processing from how you're offering it to where it gets stored. Question number three, Eric from Summersworth, New Hampshire. I built a horizontal hive from your plans. Thank you. And I'll pause right there and mention for those of you who want to see what my preferred arrangements are for Langstroth hives, for a nucleus hive, and for the long Langstroth hive, the plans are available on my website free. And the page is marked plans for you. So I'll put a link under this question so that you can find them if you want to just get ideas from them. And then of course, build your own version of it, for example. So anyway, I made a few modifications to make it uh, as bear resistant as possible. I installed a package of Saskatraz and they have been doing great. Horizontal Hive is so much easier to manage if they do well over winter. I see no reason not to go all horizontal. I have to agree. Anyone who wants to keep bees can manage them in a horizontal hive. You just eliminated all the hive manipulation, the box moving, the extraction of honey by pulling supers. Now we're just pulling frames and so on. Horizontal hives, older people, weaker people, people that have disabilities or challenges, those horizontal hives are great for accessibility. I think I might have one of those in my grandson's future. So anyway, thanks for the plans. I have a question about pulling frames. It's only been really nice in the Northeast and all resources are coming in. Aster still in bloom. I was planning on taking all fully capped frames. Is it safe to assume they will continue to process the uncapped nectar and cap it once all resources dry up this fall? I plan on leaving six frames of honey, uncapped nectar in the horizontal hive since they are deep frames. Okay, this is gonna be my personal philosophy. And I have horizontal hives, lands, and long lang. And uh, we came across solid capped frames of honey. So here's my concern about leaving still open cells. And it's for the same reason I just described before. We need warmth for them to finish it off. Uh, open cells are the cells that they're going to consume first. So the idea of pulling all the capped honey and leaving them with the open celled stored nectar that may not be finished honey yet. Um, I have concerns about that because bad weather can show up at any time this time of year and settle in and now your bees have uncapped uh, resources. I like to see the capped resources pushed up as close to the brood frames as possible. So when I'm packing down a colony of bees, any frames that are two thirds uncapped right now, 
just to be giving them the maximum use of space available, I pull those partial frames and I replace them. I move those full cap frames closer to the brood. Uh, in a horizontal hive, they're going to move from their brood frames, which should be probably seven or eight frames, I'm guessing. Uh, in my long Langstroth hive, we had seven deep frames, both sides, fully capped, fully loaded with honey. So we're leaving seven of those. That's roughly 40 to 49 pounds of honey, depending on how deep the cells are. So that's enough based on historic experience here, like every winter, what they've got left over in spring. And this is what you'll find out too. Assess the size of the colony, size of the brood, number of bees inside, and now you can speculate that they might, how much honey they're going to need to get through winter. So remember, seven solid frames of honey is not a lot. That's not even a single deep. So that's what I'm counting on them needing to get through. And for those of you who have not yet built or are building a horizontal hive, a long Langstroth, um, leave plenty of extra space. There's no reason to stop at 15 frames. Mine's a 20 frame. Uh, you can go beyond that. And there's, there's no limit other than the fact that the lumber might move a little bit on you, warp or twist or cup or something like that. Uh, if you can stabilize the lumber, there's no limit to what size your hive can be. The other thing is you can have two colonies in the same long box. I know it looks like a coffin, but uh, they actually do really well. So that's what I'm doing is I'm leaving them with uh, seven solid frames. That's enough to get them through. Now, here's the other thing I want to point out. Anyone that's using a horizontal hive, long lang, I used to lose them every winter. And I even put supplemental feed on top, which I don't do anymore. I stopped. I don't feed the horizontal hives, none of them, lands or langstroth. Uh, they come through winter just fine, and here's why. We're insulating those covers really well. On the lands hive, the back of the frames, the lands frames themselves, are the backboards. So in other words, there's nothing above them except the insulated cover. I put double bubble reflect text right on those back bars. The bees don't have access up there. They can't get up there. They're full of honey. Both of them are. They're loaded. I have every expectation they're going to just come through spring with too many bees. The long Langstroth hive, the same thing. The advantage to the long Langstroth hive is I can do thermal scans on the side of it and know where my cluster is. So I can gauge if they've consumed all of their honey or not because they're going to constantly move deeper into the hive as winter progresses. So back to just the original question, I would not count on them finishing off unfinished cells right now. I would be comfortable saying keep the capped frames of honey in there for them. And that is guaranteed that it is finished, it is honey, and they're going to get the maximum gain from the minimum space as they move over it. Keep in mind, too, that uh, when it comes to your horizontal, your long Langstroth hives, that I cut corners, right? And by that, I mean, if I'm putting a plastic foundation, whether it's, you know, Premier or it's Pirico or if it's Acorn, whatever your foundation is, I clip off the corners. So that's cutting corners and I cut a V-notch right through the top, under the top bar, right through the center. Now, the reason I do that is because in the winter time, your bees can now pass through without going up over the top bar or under or around the outsides of the frames. They can actually pass through the corners, top and bottom, or through that center hole. Now it's up to the bees. They can close it up, but here's what I've noticed that they do. It looks like they close it up and those gaps are most often filled with drone comb, so larger cells than worker comb. And it looks like they close it up completely. But then you see, I don't know if you've ever been to a, a circus and seen the clown car pull up and the clowns just keep coming out of it one after another. So when you're looking at the surface of one of those frames and you see a bee come out of a cell, that's not unusual. One bee, but before you know it, another bee comes out of the same cell, then another one, then another one. So guess what? The cell is actually open all the way through to both sides. It's a passageway. It's also a venting area for the bees. So that's why cut corners, if they want to plug it up, that's fine. If they don't want to close it up and they want to use it as a passenger for ventilation, it's up to them. But one thing honeybees cannot do, and that's chew through those plastic foundations. So uh, the uncapped stuff, not guaranteed.
your cap stuff is. So I would leave capped honey on and you can pull, if you've got a frame that's 50% uh, uncapped, you can take that out and you can dry that down yourself. You can actually extract it, collect the honey, do a honey sampling with a refractometer, which I hope every beekeeper has. If you have a favorite beekeeper and they don't have a refractometer, you just found your Christmas gift for that beekeeper. The manual refractometers are great. I have the inspector level ones, but I use those to calibrate the manual ones. So for example, if you have a bee club or a bunch of beekeepers that are together and one of them has the MISCO um, calibrated refractometer for honey water content, then you can take that and a known sample of honey and you can test it on the MISCO and you can get your 16, 17%, whatever the honey water percentage is with the MISCO calibrated unit and then everyone else takes their 25 or $30 refractometers and they sample the same honey at the same time under the same temperature parameters and they all calibrate to match what that MISCO unit said the water percentage was. And I've found this, once you've got your manual refractometer calibrated, they never change. You calibrate with a screwdriver. So it's very accurate once you figure out exactly what that water percentage is and then that's what you use to find out if the honey that you're about to store, even from uncapped frames, needs to be dried down a little bit. And if it does, you can just put it in a hot room with a fan on it and just air movement alone will dry it down. Or you can create a tent, which is what I do. And then I have a dehumidifier in there and I can take it down a full percentage of water every day. So that's what I would do. Let's see. Next question number four comes from Marie from Jacksonville, Florida. It says, can I use crystallized honey to make syrup to feed my bees? Same amount of honey and water by weight. Thanks. Okay, so here's my take on that. You have honey. And I understand people want to feed honey back to the bees. It's, it came from the bees and maybe it's honey for some reason that you just don't want to use yourself. It's crystallized. Maybe you don't care for it. So here's what I'm going to suggest though. Why add water to it? Here are the risks. If you take crystallized honey uh, and you mix it with water, 50-50 as described here, you risk it fermenting. So what happens is there's, you know, there are airborne things in the air that will attract itself to the water, to the honey and cause fermentation. And uh, why not just leave it as crystallized honey and put it out for your bees? If you're going to feed it back to the bees anyway, for example, I used to have jars down here that were full of crystallized honey. And I don't anymore because I took them out to do other things. But you can take the lid off a crystallized jar of honey, invert that on your inner cover, because after all, it's crystallized. It's not going to pour down in there. And the bees can go right up in there and consume it at straight full strength. And to me, that's much better for your bees. They get a lot more return on their energy investment when they go to process it. It is already processed honey. It is already invert sugars. So they've already used their invertase enzymes to break it down. And I see no reason to add water to it. They can get water on their own. They can do that in other ways, but I say give it full strength. The other thing that you can do is you can actually take that up to 105 degrees Fahrenheit in a you know a pan on your stove or something like that surrounded by water so there's no hot spots on it you can put a lid on it you can turn that upside down as a honey feeder again not leaving leaving it on overnight through frozen periods now if you put it on as crystallized honey and it freezes overnight no problem but if you invert the jar and you go through these days this is down in jacksonville florida i don't know what the temperature swings are like but if it dropped to 40 overnight but then with 75 degrees by the afternoon, whether the bees are consuming it or not, it's going to express itself down into that hive. And honey is a bee killer. I know it doesn't make sense, but it's so viscous and so thick that when it comes down, um, it can actually drip over your brood and kill your brood. The bees will, of course, consume it and move it around as quick as they can. But if it's already crystallized, my suggestion is to feed it that way. Don't ruin it by adding water. That's what I would do. But if you did, you could mix it up, but now you risk it spoiling. In its honey form, in its honey state, it's not going to spoil on you. Your bees will be much happier. 
Question number five comes from Gigi from Concord, California. Let's see, I'm a pending new beekeeper. I'm setting everything up now and waiting until spring to get a swarm or split from my friend's hive. I've been reading and watching as much as I can this waiting period. In episode number 213, you mentioned that you do not use a queen excluder in your hives. Does that include your flow hives? What is your hive set up with your flow hives to prevent brood in the flow frames? Thanks for your insights. Okay, so for Gigi, first of all, I hope your beekeeping experience is going to be a fantastic one. And um, there's one thing you should know. In fact, every listener should know. If you do not use a queen excluder, you run a risk of having brood anywhere inside your hive. That's my disclaimer. So having said that, Based on my years of working with bees, I started off, every hive had a queen excluder. I did all the standard setups and everything else. Uh, I started to do my own studies and practical testing with queen excluders, with the metal ones, with the plastic ones, and the plastic ones from several different manufacturers. What I discovered was, through direct observation, of course, I videoed it and I shared it on YouTube, uh, the bees a lot of them struggled a lot to get through it. So what I did was I offered sugar syrup at a time when they needed it. So they were out there and they were trying to get through there. Bumblebees are all over the place. Wasps are out there and the honeybees are out there. Once they access the sugar syrup and I give them full access for an afternoon, then nightfall comes. And the reason I'm giving you these parameters is there are people watching right now who are homeschoolers and people that want to do these backyard tests themselves. So I'm giving you the parameters to Convince yourself why I'm no longer using queen excluders. So the following morning before they're flying, I put queen excluders over these feeders that they had access to the day before. Now, watch them desperately try to access the sugar syrup. It was amazing to me how few foragers could make it through those openings. And those that did make it, how much contact there is and how much struggling there was for them to get through the queen excluder. So that left me wanting to do something different, right? So back then, I that's what convinced me to use upper openings, upper entrances. Because in my early videos, uh, I had the bees coming through an upper entrance, queen excluders down below, brood is down below, and of course the queen is below the queen excluder. That's an advantage. So I thought, well, they're coming and going from outside and so they can access everything up above and that's great and they're going to store honey much faster. What I didn't count on was the fact that uh, other than the venting that goes on when you have an upper entrance, that this conflicts with what bees would do on their own. It seemed like a perfect world. There was nothing but honey up there. And of course, the flow hive, when they sell it to you, comes with a queen excluder. You're supposed to use your brood box, queen excluder, flow super right away. I don't follow that configuration, but I'm going to give you the, the long story. So then what happened is uh, they superseded their queen or they swarmed and produced a new queen. The queen must have flown out on her mating flight, came back to the same hive. What entrance do you think she went in? She didn't go back in the main entrance of the hive. She went in the upper entrance of the hive. And now I had a queen up in my honey super and all the brood was up there. And do you think it wouldn't have been the end of the world if they would do me a favor and convert the brood box now to nothing but honey production. But no, they just emptied it out. And then everything eventually was above the queen excluder. So now let me fast forward to my current configuration and why what I'm doing works so well. So I start with a brood box. So every spring, every hive has at least a 10 frame or eight frame deep brood box, unless it's a nucleus hive and they just have the five frame boxes, five over five, or we add another layer, the Apame nucleus hive, which has seven frames on every level. Okay, first level gets filled, and then we see that they've got their brood, that they're committed, no queen excluder, the second box goes on. Second box goes on, they fill most of the frames. Let's say a percentage instead of the number of frames because we're dealing with all the different configurations I just explained. 
So now they fill that second box and it's, you know, nine out of 10, eight out of nine, you know, seven out of eight, whatever it is. They're all full, they're all capped. Now we add another one. Now this is what I call the honey bridge. And so once I see that I have frames that are nothing but honey, the next one above that, and that's where the flow super comes in, but it doesn't have to be the flow super, it's any super above and beyond that second box. On rare occasions, the brood has expanded into the second box more than halfway into it. I don't have confidence in that. So then I'll add a third box, which means a deep and two mediums. I've never had two deeps go full brood all the way to the top of the second deep. So my bottom two boxes, whether that's a medium and a deep or two deeps or a medium and two or a deep and two mediums, those are my stopping points and everything above that is pure honey. How do I keep the brood from showing up up above? I have a single entrance on the landing board. The single entrance is not a huge entrance. It's normally up to three inches wide for those that perform the best. Now, that single entrance means that they're going to keep their brood down there. They keep their brood wherever the entrance happens to be. You'll see the brood fan out from there and then it will progress into uh, food and resources for the brood. So you're going to see a bunch of pollen near that. And then beyond that, you're going to see a bunch of honey. And usually it'll be the uncapped honey first. And then it migrates up until they get the capped honey. And then up it goes until there's nothing but honey. Now this gets reinforced for me every single year. The last thing on earth I want to see when I'm watching my flow hives, when I'm watching the honey coming out of the flow tube, and I sit there and watch, why wouldn't I? Drink my tea or coffee or whatever. Watch the honey coming out of those flow tubes. If any larvae came out of there, that would be, that's a ruined frame. And if it's going into the jar, that's a ruined jar of honey. So I watch it to see if any little C-shaped little larvae come out of there. And they don't. Could it? Yes, it could. And here's why. Because I did tests in the past because I just want to see things. I want to know stuff for the sake of knowledge. So no queen excluder, leave the flow super on right through winter, leave it full of honey, because the original claim was that either they would produce drone brood in there only, and that they would not use work, have worker brood in there, or that the cells were too large or too deep for the queen to lay her eggs. But they did, they developed brood. So they put eggs in there, they developed brood in the flow frames. Now, is that the end of the world? It's actually not, because I'm also going to explain the fix for that if that were to happen. But if you follow what I'm describing right now, none of your supers above your third box or your second box, depending on your configuration, will have brood in them if there's no top venting and there's no upper entrance. So you keep your brood down there and this gets reinforced. I'm constantly asking people that are doing rip outs that are dealing with feral colonies, what the configuration is, how do they distribute their resources? Did you see a bunch of brood very far away from the entrance or did they consistently have brood near the entrance, stores and resources that were mixed with bee bread and everything else and then it goes to nothing but pure honey and the story is the same 99% of the time. Single entrance, a predictable distribution of resources, no need for the queen excluder. So there it goes. That works. And I'm gonna give you a link for those of you who are uh, wanting to check that out. Uh, there's another video that I show you what my winter configurations are for flow hives. And I also explain the philosophy, but it's exactly what I've just described to you. Now, do I accept responsibility if you don't use your queen excluder and you end up with some eggs or something in the upper box. There is some risk. You're going to have to be vigilant about it. You're gonna to have to inspect your frames. Before you uncap and extract honey from your hive, you're going to have to understand that the risk is there. It is very unlikely, but it could happen. So the thing of it is honey production is so much better. So for your flow hive specifically, the deep box, a medium super, then your flow super once those are full or nearly full.
Question number six, moving on. This comes from Michael from Rochester. I'm going to say Maine. Okay. My honey is cloudy and has foam on top. I'm using two sieve systems, 600, but the honey has no visible particles. Do people shy away from buying cloudy raw honey? It looks kind of like Manuka. The honey I processed last year wasn't foamy at all. Should I filter the batch with a finer screen? How do you screen your honey? Okay, so that's a lot of questions all together from Michael. Um, first of all, the foam on top. Let's talk about that. Honey defends itself. Honey is antibacterial. Honey has a high sugar content, which protects it and keeps it from degrading. Sometimes you'll see a very light foam on top of it. Sometimes, how do, my next question is, how does it smell? Sometimes you'll smell some slight fermentation going on. Because my first question when we get a lot of foam and stuff is that it might have been exposed to moisture. That there could be some condensation forming on the surface of your honey. And then what does it produce? Hydrogen peroxide. That's right. Honey produces its own hydrogen peroxide as a defensive measure. And you'll see it wherever water is located. I'll give you another example of that. One of the proven scientific medical uses for honey, raw honey, is to cover an injury, cover a wound, a scar, and it's been proven to help scars heal. So one of the things that you would see if you put the honey on a dressing and put that dressing on any kind of oozing wound, I'm sorry to give you that description, but if there's moisture or water in the, in the wound, what does honey do? Honey's hygroscopic, which means it's gonna absorb that in. But on the surface where it faces that, you actually had honey producing hydrogen peroxide. That's really interesting. So anyway, back to the jar. My first suspicion is if you see that foam and you've got that moisture on the surface is that there's condensation. The other thing is I want to go back to mentioning the refractometer. I'd like you to check that honey and make sure as a starting point that you do have a low moisture content. We don't want that to be above 19% um, water. Okay. So let's say it's at, it's below the 19 and it's good and it's stable. The next thing is the fogginess of the honey. Are people put off by it? I say personally, no. In fact, where I live right now, we're getting asters and goldenrod honey at the end of the year. And that stuff hazes up pretty fast. In fact, it will crystallize or set in the jar also pretty fast. In just a matter of weeks, you can start to see it solidifying. Now it goes the other way. I find that people like that even more. That if they scoop it out and the honey is very dense like that, they put it, they're going to put it on, you know, in their tea, in their coffee. They're going to put it on, you know, warm biscuits or something. That's going to melt it down. But I've not noticed that that's a detriment. So it would be interesting to see uh, how many people that are watching or listening right now uh, would be bothered if your honey were not crystal clear. See, I go the other way. If you look at highly processed, superheated, super filtered honey, pasteurized honey, that's when you're going to see the really clear stuff with absolutely nothing in it. Uh, there's a taste difference too. And I'm not saying that crystallizing changes the taste. I'm saying that the less processing that's gone into the honey, the lower filtering that's happened, uh, the more flavor tends to be retained. In other words, if you, you didn't heat it and potentially damage the honey, you could heat it and liquefy it and make it clearer, but it does take away some of the smell of the honey and some of the taste of the honey. So the more warming and processing that it goes through, the more damage is done to retaining its original floral attributes. I hope that makes sense. The other part of it is the 600 uh, filter. So for example, um, the Pierce company that makes those uncapping knives and makes those cut comb things, they also sell a uncapping tank and it comes with a great big filter in it. When I saw those guys at the convention at the conference, I asked them, what is the micron rating of the filter that they're using? And it's 600. So that's just like described here. And you're right. It takes most visible particulates out, but I'm going to ask you to consider maybe another layer to your filtering. So while the honey is being processed, while it's been spun out or whatever your processing method is, Use your 600 filter as your primary filter to get the wax bits and pieces, the uncapping bits, and any propolis and things like that that found their way into your honey. 
Um, as it goes through the 600, now we're filtered down, I would recommend going down to a 200 micron filter. And the reason for that is, and that's my stopping point, by the way, I don't uh, take out anything finer than that because at 200, the pollen and stuff is still getting through. So that's kind of one of the marks of raw honey is the fact that it has pollen and the things that came from the actual plant the bees worked, that those attributes are still part of the honey. So I go down to a 200 and I find out that doing that extra step alone uh, clears up your honey quite a bit. It won't prevent it from setting, but the reason your honey crystallizes or fogs is because there are particulates in there and they are attaching themselves, the crystals are attaching to that and then they're starting to solidify the honey. So 600 filter, great start, 200 microns, great finisher. And then if it gets foggy, I don't know, what do you think? The viewer right now, what are your opinions about foggy honey? I think it's good to go. So question number seven now comes from uh, first name Liquid Amber. I don't know if I, if I trust that first name. Anyway, from the state of Oregon, it says, hello, thanks for your great videos. I'm a third year beekeeper in the Pacific Northwest. It's time to pack down the hive, so I busted into two of my six hives today. One hive I overwintered and the other I caught one of my many swarms this year and even harvested honey from it. 10 frame laying and one super on each. To my surprise, I found zero brood in one and scant at best in the other. We still have forage. Temps are in the 70s and 80s. I found a queen in each hive. One is a second year queen, yellow from my swarm, and I marked the other red. So this year was red for the thorax. There are about six to eight frames of bees in each. Enough honey stored for winter in one and the other would be light, but okay. Not sure why there's no brood and wondering if I should join these hives. I have yet to test or treat for mites, but with no brood, I will do an OA vape. Thanks. Okay, so for liquid amber, I would say, uh, by the way, having a broodless period right now is prime opportunity to treat with oxalic acid vaporization. So kudos for doing that. You'll get 96% efficacy on those mites. Why not? So the other thing is, uh, I have this situation in some of my hives myself right now. So here's why I'm not at all concerned. Uh, you saw the queen. So what we do is when we see the queen, and these are in my observation hives, they, uh, some of them requeened late in the year. But when we see the queen, we identify the queen, take a picture of her if we can get it. We write it up on the whiteboard, date, time, hive, and what she looked like. So then we know that we have queens and brood production is held off a little bit. So depending on, and this is why you can have differences, hives right beside each other and same environmental circumstances, different bees produce different amounts of brood with different changes in the seasons. So there are a lot of things going on. There are environmental cues out there. One is, of course, the availability of resources, but what else is going on? Uh, you have temps in the 70s and 80s. That's really outstanding, but the length of the day is being reduced. The opportunities for forage, right along with the length of the day, uh, are reduced, right? So depending on the genetics of the bees that you have in there, some queens will back off early. So here's what I've noticed about, for example, the Carniolan queens. Uh, they reduce their brood very fast. So does that mean that the colony's in trouble? Actually, no. So if we're talking about the one that you think has maybe enough resources, they're just not great, but also they have a reduced brood that you're not able to see. So then that tells me that with fewer brood, smaller cluster going into winter and less resources, they're also going to consume fewer resources. So then if you've got the other hive, that seems to have more brood, more productive, but more resources, well, they're gonna use more of those resources because the number of bees in the hive is also higher. Now, the other thing I'm going to mention, uh, because it didn't, liquid amber didn't describe what the, uh, you know, what the arrangement is of the hive. In other words, are we using insulated inner covers? So I wanna plug that practice right now. 
Because depend, it doesn't even matter where you're living. If it's warm or cold, it makes no difference. If you would, please use an insulated inner cover and then have an insulated outer cover. What we're trying to avoid and what I want people that are listening to me to understand is if condensation occurs inside your hive, I would really like it and your bees would like it if it did not occur over the cluster where condensation could drip down on your bees during winter. So if you can insulate your inner cover and have an insulated outer cover and maybe a feeder shim up above your inner cover to have space for you to do things to emergency, feed your bees if you needed to. But now the interior sidewalls are where the dew point would be achieved and where condensation would form and the bees need that. So I'm just gonna throw that out there because other people might be setting things up or configuring their hives for winter. Insulated inner covers are a winning thing to do for your bees. If you insulate nothing else, please do that. So the other thing is, uh, and for those of you who are observing low uh, brood this time of year. So us, for example, my grandson who has his first hive, they're over a month old, but uh, you have an opportunity before the 21st day, um, the bees are going to hatch out, but in your first week when you've installed them in a hive, you collected a swarm, you got a package or something like that, uh, when you get to the eighth or ninth day, that's when you should be doing your oxalic acid vaporization or down the pike, like my grandson's hive. Wall to wall, honey, the queen's in there. They have the tiniest brood cluster right now, which is not a concern to me because they're going to consume the honey in the middle of the cluster and the queen is going to begin laying in those recently available or vacated cells. So as they consume the honey out of the cells, the queen is going to be laying, they're going to be starting to produce more of their winter bees. So that's not a problem at all. What a great opportunity if they have mites to give them a single treatment of oxalic acid vaporization and give the one, two punch to whatever mites might be existing in that hive. So for liquid amber, I hope uh, we'll get some feedback later and a follow up. What did you find? What did you end up doing? And how are the bees responding? The other thing is I want to know how many mites are in there. Uh, when you do the treatment, always check to see uh, if the mites died. Now, if you have a standard bottom board, you're not going to know. But if you have removable trays, screen bottoms and things like that, you will be able to see the results of your mite treatment over the next 48 hours. Question number eight comes from, from Brad, and uh, this just came today, by the way. So it says, question about OAV treatments. Should it be done every seven days and for three sessions? Is that correct? Okay, so here's the thing. Um, one of the websites I like to go to because they're science-based and they often provide additional information just like this uh, because it used to be when we first got oxalic acid vaporization approved or oxalic acid treatment period because there's a dribble there's a drench there's vaporization those are the three methods that are approved so fogging and all the other options that are out there where you use mineral oil or whatever else those are not approved methods of delivering oxalic acid as a miticide so if we're doing dribble spray drench or the vaporization, which is sublimation, solid to gas. Um, those are the methods. And it used to say every seven days, so you got a 21 day span, right? Three cycles, seven days apart. That has changed. Most people are doing every five days and they're doing four treatments. And then if at the end of that fourth treatment, if they're dead mite numbers, you need to have a means of finding out what the mite drop is after a treatment. Uh, then after that fourth treatment, if there was still a big load of mites, then they did a fifth and that was kind of the end of it. Now we hear other people saying that they just give a treatment, they give a treatment, they give a treatment, give a treatment, give a treatment until their mites don't show up anymore. They continue to treat. I would like to, I couldn't find it, by the way. I looked up all the information. It's not on the package. The dose is on the package. Delivery methods are approved. All the things are described except periodicity. How many cycles of treatments are you supposed to give? The Better Bee website doesn't list it anymore. 
So uh, I would like to provide food for thought about that. The longer or the more extended or the more consistently you provide a single treatment, right now there's no evidence that the mice are developing a resistance or a tolerance to oxalic acid. Nothing supporting that right now. But what I would suggest is just based on how tolerance is developed, that providing extended treatment cycles over an extended period of time and continuing to do that, your chances of producing tolerant or resistant mites increases. Just because they haven't determined that they could develop that resistance right now doesn't mean we want to help them get there. So we like to give prime treatment opportunities. So there again, just as we described earlier, if the brood is small, it's a great time for the single treatment. So last year at the end of November, the first week of December, I gave a single oxalic acid vaporization treatment to every colony in my apiary except the lands and the long lang. All the others got treatments. Some of my nukes did not get treatments. So then of course, the following year, we do my counts to see how things went. The Long Langstroth hive was the only one that required secondary mite treatments. They had higher mite numbers. So the other colonies all went through spring. We had one hive uh, that kind of died out on me in spring. And uh, that one ended up having mites. So then I have to say that we treated the whole upper apiary because there's so much exchange of bees going on there's so much drift happening. There's so much sharing occurring. And when a colony dies and we get these warm days, the likelihood that that colony gets robbed is high. Now, if they're dying out slow, that's actually the high risk colony. And let me explain why. If that colony dies out slow, it means that the bees are leaving the colony and drifting to other colonies. Those bees that are still alive are very likely to have for road destructor mites on their bodies when they fly to other colonies and they infect those colonies with new mite loads. Now, if the colony, let's say back in January or you know mid-December, if they died then, that's much better if we're trying to limit the spread of varroa destructor mites. Why? Because the host is dead. So the varroa destructor mites are left in a hive where the bees have died out. Uh, the varroa destructor mites have no host and therefore they die also so that later when we get a warm up, if other bees fly in and rob it out, which I don't recommend you let them do, but if they happen to do that, they won't be coming home with varroa destructor mites that they gained from a colony that was overwhelmed by them and died. So um, I think we just got such a good handle on them uh, at, the end of, at the end of November, beginning of December, which is historically our very low brood time and so therefore the most effective um, treatment for the mites. And the reason if you're not understanding why I'm saying that, it's because uh, oxalic acid is one of those things that has to be in direct contact with the varroa destructor mites to function. So for example, if there's pupa, so if there's cap cells, a developing brood, the oxalic acid is not making physical contact with the mites that are in those cells. And that's why uh, I'm encouraging people when you have a low brood or no brood period, that's your chance to let them have it. When you get that package of bees from somebody, that's your chance to let them have it. One cycle, one treatment can take all those mites right down to ground zero. And then uh, throughout the year, they have to build back up and they may never achieve the numbers significant enough to destroy your hives. And this is also why some people that don't count mites, that don't treat their hives, uh, end up on their third year of beekeeping, their third winter more specifically, uh, that's when they end up seeing real evidence of an unhealthy colony or when they sometimes bomb and lose all of their colonies that third winter. And that's because we get a real sense of, wow, I'm such a great beekeeper right now because the first year they did great, didn't treat. It happened to me because I was uh, wanting to be a treatment-free beekeeper I started off that way, I did it for 10 years. I lost 30 to 40% of my hives every single winter. Uh, the interesting part of that was, and the logic in my head was, 
uh, people that were treating their colonies were also suffering the same losses, if not more. False sense of confidence. Because then when I hit my third year, the losses were at 50%. And then beyond that, when I hit my 10th, so I was cycling back and forth, losing half my hives, 40% of my hives, building them back up, losing 40% every single winter until my 10th year when oxalic acid, because it's an organic treatment, it's a soft acid, when that came out as an approved treatment, that's when I decided to start treating my hives and my uh, die outs dropped to about 20%. So they were making it through the winter, but more than that, it wasn't just whether they died or lived. It was the fact that the ones that made it were very strong. So in other words, getting the mites off of my bees resulted in not just survivor stock, but bees, and be careful about saying survivor stock, they weren't just winter survivors, but uh, they resulted in bees that were very prolific. So even though your colonies might be making it and limping along, they have sub-lethal impacts on the hive through the virus loads that are vectored by the varroa destructor mites. And so therefore you get less foraging time, you get a shorter lifespan on the bees. So as they do progress through the jobs in the hive and they do start to fly out and start to forage, they're getting half the time that they otherwise would have had they not been loaded with these varroa mite vectored diseases and pathogens. So getting your mites under control results not only in your colonies surviving better, but performing better and living longer. So I'll get off my soapbox on that. So anyway, uh, the best I can do for Brad here is to say that most people have dropped to five days. Your goal is to at some point when you deliver a treatment that these mites are exposed, get the treatment and die. So we want their little feet not to be able to hang onto the bees anymore. And uh, I really like the idea of screen bottom boards, some kind of insert so you can tell what the die-off levels are. That was the last question for this Friday the 13th. So, first thing I want to do, I'm going to give a shout out today. I forgot to give a shout out last week, but today it's going to be Dirt Rooster, Randy McCaffrey. He did this really cool cutout of an RV. I'm going to put a link to it. But it should not be hard for you to find if you're on YouTube right now or you're doing a search. Uh, Hive Cutout RV or Randy McCaffrey Dirt Rooster. And you'll find it, you'll look at it, and it's really cool. And one of the reasons it's really cool is not just because Randy mentioned me. Thank you for that. Uh, but because it reinforces some of the things I talked about. These are my go-to people. Randy McCaffrey, Mr. Ed, people that do rip out after rip out after rip out, they're a gold mine of information and they reinforce what I'm already telling people when it comes to using a small single entrance so that you don't have to use a queen excluder and so that your bees will get through winter better, healthier, insulated in cover. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Go see Randy's video. It uh, is getting a lot of views, doesn't need my help at all. It's a very interesting video and you get to see how the bees can figure everything over what he thinks is a period of about three years. So very interesting. The other thing is thank you for those of you who watched my grandson's video yesterday. He is eight years old. He got his own colony of bees and it wasn't planned. According to him, the bees knew that he needed a hive. That's why they presented themselves on a tree at the end of August. So he's had them for a month. He checks on them all the time. That doesn't mean he opens the hive. But anyway, we did the video and you get to hear his take on a lot of things. He's getting a lot of experience in a very short amount of time and he's kind of on his way. So see that one. And if you've got kids, you know, elementary school age kids that have questions, post their questions for Quinn. And uh, I'm gonna try to do a separate video where he answers questions from other kids. Ask me what he's doing right now. Right now, today, he's on a field trip with his class and they're at a farm and the farm has a bungalow for honeybees. And he, of course, is going to explain to his classmates about honeybees. 
And I think that's just like the coolest thing ever. The other thing I'd like to recommend, I've already talked about the same stuff. Robbing is at a frenzied state right now. All of your entrances should be reduced. Um, the other thing is we should be finding out if any of your colonies are queenless. This is your last opportunity before the weather turns bad forever. And there's nothing you're going to do about it. you got a queenless colony. If you have another colony, you need to combine them. Uh, otherwise, you can just let them run out their lives. A lot of people say, oh, that's really cruel. You're, you're not taking care of your bees if they're going to die because they're queenless. Well, really, they're not dying uh, because they're queenless. The colony would die out. But each of the bees inside that colony, some of them will drift to other hives on their own. Others will live out their lives and there just won't be any replacements coming behind them. It's not that you're torturing your bees to death. You're just going to lose the colony because they're queenless and they can't reproduce. Uh, the ditch effort, this is where you'll start to see tiny drones. Drones are not all the same size. Uh, laying workers will often lay their drone eggs in worker cells and that you end up with bullet cells with these little extremely convex caps on them because what they've parked in there is too big for the cell but you also get undersized drones you see these little peewee drones that's interesting to me too that the size of the cell impacted of course is the amount of food and resources they give them too but they're restricted physically by the size of the cell they're in and they just pop out the top. The other thing is they don't even have the same number of lenses in their eyes. It's really weird. Anyway, uh, so combine them. This is your ditch effort. This is your last chance. The other thing is if you don't have fondant or some kind of emergency feed, uh, a lot of people just say, well, I'm just not going to feed my bees. I just let them live or die. Uh, so last year, as I described earlier, all the Langstroth hives get fondant packs on top of all of them. I used to put dry sugar on them in rapid rounds. I've shifted that completely because of last winter's success. We're putting fondant packs on every single Langstroth hive. The Lance hives are getting nothing. The Long Langstroth hive is getting nothing. A lot of the Nucleus hives are getting nothing. Uh, and that's because they're solid honey at the top. They're really loaded and there's no facility in the hive design to feed them. Appa May hives have those narrow hive top feeders that are split up. And so we'll be taking fondant packs and cutting them in half and then just dropping them in there and shifting those little feeder covers. For those of you who have the Appa May hives, we'll feed them to the solid food part and the bees can get up in there. Now, normally, if you open up a space, a cavity like that, and your bees can access it, they would build a bunch of burr comb and they would start to brace it up, right? But look at the time of year we're in. This is not a time of year, at least in the northeastern United States. When things are cooling off and then when nights are freezing and things like that, and you put that fondant pack in there and they have to get access to a space, you know, I don't know what the physical dimensions are. They would build comb in there if this happened in the summertime. But the fact that it's winter, they will go up there and consume resources and go back down below. They're very unlikely to fill that space with comb. So then when spring comes and the warmer days show up again, you got to get your fondant packs out of there and switch those little uh, feeder entrances back to the syrup setting so the bees can no longer access the space. And so they won't be building strange wonky comb all up through there because you're going to need access to that. So uh, the other thing is if you're growing plants, one of the strongest flowers right now that's still staying and still doing well, asters are still well represented in the environment. Uh, the other thing is uh, the cosmos. Cosmos flowers are strong and there's a lot of uh, pollen being gathered from them and the bees are spending a lot of time on each blossom which tells us they're still producing a lot of nectar. Uh, the Maximilian sunflowers are waning already so the goldenrod basically gone. Um, so the environment is starting to withdraw and our bees will likewise start to scale back their production. So that's it for today. I want to thank you for spending your time with me and I hope you learned something new and I look forward to seeing your comments down below. So if you want to leave your own topic as a suggestion for next Friday, please go to thewaytobe.org and click on the Way to Be page and you can fill out the form there. Thanks for watching. Have a fantastic weekend. Mm -hmm.